This video is meant for educational purposes only and does not replace your department's official policies and procedures for nitrous oxide. RT party! This video is going to go over the basics behind inhaled nitrous oxide therapy for procedural sedation. Now it's important not to confuse nitrous oxide with nitric oxide with the chemical formula NO, especially since I've previously done a video on the mechanism behind nitric oxide therapy for pulmonary vasodilation in refractory hypoxemic respiratory failure. This video is nitrous oxide with the chemical formula N2O. So first, nitrous oxide. How does it work to achieve sedation? We're going to talk about that briefly here, but more importantly, I want to emphasize the difference between dissociative agents like nitrous oxide and ketamine and other sedative medications such as propofol or Versed. Now drawn here is a neuronal cell junction with the presynaptic and postsynaptic membrane. Located on the postsynaptic membrane are channels for both cations such as sodium and calcium and anions such as chloride. Recall that due to ion differences across the cell membrane, the resting membrane potential is roughly negative 70 millivolts. When the membrane becomes more positive to the point where it reaches a threshold potential, voltage-gated ion channels open and the action potential is propagated. Therefore, stopping a positive charge from entering the cell will keep the membrane potential below the threshold and action potentials will cease to fire, causing sedation. So that poses the next question, how do we keep the cell membrane negative? Well, we can either allow more negatively charged chloride ions to enter, directly making the cell potential more negative by hyperpolarizing the cell, or we can block the positively charged sodium and calcium ions from entering the cell. Both ways can keep the membrane from becoming positive and causing depolarization and action potential propagation. Most of the agents we're familiar with that cause sedation do so by allosteric activation of the GABA receptor. Recall that GABA, which stands for gamma aminobutyric acid, is a primary inhibitory neurotransmitter in the CNS. When it binds to its receptor, which is a chloride ion channel, chloride flows into the cell causing hyperpolarization and CNS depression. Now the thing about GABA receptors is that it also has allosteric sites for several other compounds, all of which increase or mimic the effect of GABA. There are sites for benzodiazepines such as midazolam and alprazolam, there are sites for barbiturates, general anesthetics such as isoflurane or etomidate, and even a site for ethanol which can explain why people pass out after a night of heavy drinking. All of these cause an increase in chloride flow into the cell. Now recall that CNS depression can either be achieved through hyperpolarization by increasing chloride influx or by blocking depolarization by decreasing sodium and calcium influx. But just like there are receptors for chloride influx targeted by GABA, there are also receptors for sodium and calcium influx targeted by glutamate, which you might recall is the main excitatory neurotransmitter in the body. These receptors are called AMPA and NMDA receptors. So when glutamate binds, a positive influx of cations increases the resting membrane potential until an action potential propagates. Therefore, blocking this influx of cations can also cause a dissociative sedation effect, and we see this when we administer things like ketamine, which is an NMDA receptor antagonist. So now that we reviewed the two different mechanisms by which medications cause CNS depression and sedation, let's quickly talk about nitrous oxide. Now many mechanisms have been proposed over the years, with its first reported use dating back to the 1800s. But the most recent literature describes nitrous having multiple effects. It provides an anesthetic effect through non-competitive NMDA receptor antagonism, much like ketamine, and blocking cation influx. It also provides anxiolytic effects through GABA-A activation, promoting anion influx. Furthermore, it provides analgesic effects through the release of endogenous opioids that act on opioid receptors. In addition, nitrous is known to have a central sympathetic stimulating effect that maintains both cardiac output and respiratory drive. This in addition to its low solubility leading to quick effects on the brain with a shorter induction time, make it an ideal choice for pediatric procedural sedation in the ER. One last thing to keep in mind with nitrous is that because of its low blood solubility, it diffuses rapidly into air spaces in the body and will increase its volume. For most of our pediatric patient population presenting with things like fractures needing a reduction, this isn't an issue, but this should be avoided with patients with conditions such as a pneumothorax or a perf viscous as nitrous oxide can cause a rapid increase in the cavity size. So now that you have a basic understanding of how nitrous oxide causes sedation, let's get to the setup and administration. RTs, you're in charge of the initial equipment setup. First, talk to the ED charge nurse to have the nitrous tank unlocked. The nitrous storage is kept by room 28, directly behind the ED lobby check-in desk.
The tank and flow meter is kept in the storage cabinet, while the disposable circuit and nasal masks are kept in the adjacent unlocked cabinet. Gather your disposable circuit, an end tidal CO2 monitoring line, and the appropriately sized nasal masks. Keep in mind your disposable circuit comes with a sizing template. Use that to determine the appropriate sizes rather than opening all three masks. Next is a setup. First open the circuit, find one end, it doesn't matter which end because they're the same on both sides, and each end should have a larger diameter tube and a smaller diameter tube. Connect the large tubing to the vacuum gauge and connect the small tube to the 22 millimeter 90 degree elbow, which then connects to the flow meter outlet. The other end of the vacuum gauge should then be connected to suction. Next, size your mask by placing the sizing guides included with the circuit to the patient's nose. The ideal mask should fit comfortably but without allowing much leak. Open the appropriately determined nasal mask size and attach it to the other end of the circuit. Finally, test the suction lever to make sure the scavenging system can adequately be controlled before turning on the nitrous. Great, now it's time to turn on the tanks. Open the tank starting with oxygen, followed by nitrous. Watch the gauges and listen for about 10 seconds to be sure there's no pressure leak. If so, check the seating of the tanks on the regulator. Next, begin filling out the nitrous tank log, being sure to compare your starting PSI with the ending PSI from the previous procedure. Perform a brief pre-use check by turning the unit on, visualizing a baseline 3 liter per minute O2 flow, testing the O2 flush control, and turning the nitrous flow knob wide open and visualizing a maximum of 7 liters per minute. This unit also has a fail-safe mechanism in which nitrous stops flowing in the event that O2 pressure is lost. This is to prevent any inadvertent hypoxemia. You want to test this mechanism by turning the nitrous flow to 7 liters and turning the O2 to 3 liters. Turn the O2 tank off and you should see a complete flow shut off with both O2 and nitrous. The unit's now ready for use. In addition to maintaining the airway like any other procedural sedation, it's your job as the RT to keep an eye on the scavenger unit and the suction gauge and adjust the lever to keep the suction in the green zone throughout the administration of nitrous. You don't want any of us breathing it in during the procedure. Dr. Annabella will now discuss the proper use for our physicians. We'll walk you through the steps of the nitrous oxide sedation procedure for pediatric patients. As a part of your pre-procedure checklist, be sure to have the RT check the equipment and scavenger. Review indications and contraindications for the procedure. Perform a procedural timeout by confirming patient identification with two identifiers and confirm the procedure to be performed. A child can hold the mask if able, otherwise a parent or staff can hold it. Be sure to keep the patients talking and mouth breathing to a minimum to achieve sedation. Next, turn on the unit and allow the patient to breathe 100% oxygen for at least 30 seconds. Set the oxygen flow rate to equal the total gas flow per minute volume to be administered to the patient. A flow rate of 5 to 6 liters per minute is generally acceptable for most patients. Gradually introduce nitrous oxide flow rate while proportionately decreasing oxygen flow rate and still maintaining gas flow. Shown here is a chart showing the proper flow rates to achieve the desired delivery percentage. For example, you can use a nitrous flow rate of 3 liters per minute and an oxygen flow rate of 3 liters per minute for a total flow rate of 6 liters. Essentially, you'll deliver 50% nitrous and 50% oxygen with that breakdown in flow. If oxygen is required to keep the O2 saturation greater than 90%, press the oxygen flush button. Titrate starting with 30% nitrous and 70% oxygen. Decrease incrementally by about 0.5 to 1 liter every 30 to 60 seconds to a maximum of 70% nitrous oxide to achieve desired effect and maintain an SpO2 of greater than 90%. Be sure to check in with the patient before each increase in nitrous flow. The typical patient requires 30 to 50% nitrous oxide to achieve ideal sedation. If you get to the 50% mark, you can have the patient breathe in the 50% nitrous for 3 to 5 minutes. If the patient has not gotten to the desired sedation effect, you can incrementally increase to a maximum of 70% nitrous, but you often don't need to. Nitrous reaches its peak effects about 5 minutes from the start of administration. It is important to note that only the physician can adjust the flow rate. After the procedure is done, and once nitrous is turned off, give 100% oxygen for 3 to 5 minutes. After this, remove the breathing circuit and breathe room air for about one to two minutes. 
You may discharge the patient once mentation and vital signs return to baseline. There's no additional monitoring required. Now, documentation for procedural sedation for RTs, RNs, and physicians will all be more or less the same as it was before. RTs will still document airway management with a free text narrative, and physicians will still document their procedure note accordingly. RN documentation will still require the procedural sedation packet and consent form, as well as vitals documentation on IV. The key difference in IV for nurses is the O2 method. Now, instead of selecting one of the pre-filled options, click Other and type N2O slash O2 interface. Now, it's important that the leader flow below this field be left blank, as it may cause confusion as to whether the flow is O2 alone or the total flow with nitrous. In addition, there's no place to document just the nitrous flow. So instead, nitrous and O2 flow will be documented at the end of the vital section navigator band under the additional info field. Leader flow conversions to percentages can be found on the Belmed Nitrous Oxide Percentage Card, which is located directly on the machine. However, the physician will most likely be verbally stating their dosage changes for you as they go, just as they would for any other medication. With the nitrous flow meter off, make a note of the ending PSI on the nitrous tank log. Then, turn off the nitrous tank first while leaving the O2 tank on. After the tank is off, open the nitrous flow meter to expel any remaining nitrous from the regulator. You should see a drop in the pressure gauge. Now once the gauge is at zero, close the oxygen tank and observe the same drop in regulator pressure. Both tank pressure readings should return to zero before returning the unit to storage. We thank you guys very much for watching and we hope this video was helpful.